Welcome back. In this module, we're going to talk about meta-analysis, some of its uses and how to do it. So why is meta-analysis important? Well, we need to solve the crises of replicability and interpretability in order to build a cumulative science. And meta-analysis is one of the principal ways of doing that. So what is meta-analysis? With any study, there's a risk that the conclusion is wrong, that it's a false positive, or that it's lim limited in its generalizability across experiments and contexts. So meta-analysis is the analysis of findings across publications from different research groups. It can help establish the likelihood of the true findings, uh, the generalizability across studies and populations and research teams, and it can also help evaluate the heterogeneity across studies that can point to moderating variables, things that are influencing the sizes of those effects or the incidence of those effects that we hadn't previously thought of. So what is meta-analysis? Meta-analysis often combines summary statistics like effect sizes across a population of studies or group of studies based on reported values in the publications themselves. So in neuroimaging, the most common practice is to analyze reported activation coordinates from published tables. This is called coordinate-based meta-analysis. And the coordinates are usually reported in standardized space in virtually every study or most studies. So we can get a pretty good sample of the literature from this. And the coordinates usually reflect the location of peak statistic values, and they're often reported in Montreal Neurologic Institute space, MNI space, or what's called Taylor Act space, which is an approximation uh, that's similar to MNI space, but less precisely defined. So these X, Y, and Z coordinates refer here to coordinates in brain space. The zero point is the anterior commissure, the small commissure that connects the hemispheres, and you can see on a structural scan and mark it off. And X is left to right, uh, Y is posterior to anterior, and Z is inferior to superior by convention. So we can take all these reported coordinates and put them into a series of studies. So coordinate-based meta-analyses will turn this collection of coordinates across the brain uh, into a picture of where the consistent findings are uh, and where, the, where the, there's a significant density of, of reported coordinates that exceeds what you expect by chance. Um, so we can use this for a number of things. One is we can use it to establish consensus across studies. We can evaluate the specificity of the activation across categories of mental events or types of studies. And we can come up with a priori hypotheses, which can be regions or patterns that can improve inferences in your study. Finally, we can use this as a guide to interpret findings in new studies as well and, and make better inferences about what the brain maps mean. A similar concept is called mega-analysis. It's often possible to combine image data and reanalyze image data from participants across many studies, for example. And this is often called image-based meta-analysis or mega-analysis. And this is actually preferred where it's possible to do that, to coordinate-based meta-analysis, because it's much richer in information. We have effect sizes across every voxel in the brain. So, for example, here's a pain meta-analysis done two ways. On top is an image-based mega-analysis across a number of studies. Uh, and on the bottom is a coordinate-based meta-analysis. And at its heart, any coordinate-based meta-analysis is going to attempt in some way to reconstruct what the maps look like and then do a test for consistency across studies on those maps. Meta-analysis is increasingly popular, so the number of meta-analysis have been going up across the years, and that's in part a response to the huge number of studies that are coming out and the need to synthesize and interpret findings. So some of the topics of meta-analyses you can see below, they range from things like schizophrenia, depression, emotion, various disease categories, and various other kinds of basic cognitive processes. So let's look now at some tools for doing meta-analysis and then how we can use them. So one of the tools for coordinate-based meta-analysis uh, that you can download and use is called Multi-Level Kernel Density Analysis, MKDA. You can download it. Another tool is a web-based tool called neurosynth.org. And finally, there's uh, brainmap.org, which is a repository of coordinates and a tool for doing activation likelihood meta-analyses, which is a very similar method to MKDA. And so here's kind of how it works. We take the reported coordinates in the literature across a population of studies, uh, and we can break them up into 
which study they came from and which specific contrast or map within that study that they came from. So that's what we mean by contrast here. So those are contrast specific coordinates. We need to know which studies they came from because we're going to take each of those and the points are very sparse in space. So we're going to convolve them with a kernel, a spherical kernel in this case, and then we end up with a reconstructed contrast map from each of those studies. Then we take a weighted average of those contrast maps and from that we get, uh, we get a, a map of how consistent the activations are. We simulate a null hypothesis case by permuting the location, shuffling the locations of the, of the activations uh, and taking a weighted average again and again and again over many iterations and finding the maximum statistic value just like we would with multiple comparisons correction in other venues. And finally then we can apply that threshold and end up with results that are corrected uh, for multiple comparisons. And what we're really then saying when we have a significant result is here's an area where the consistency of activation across studies exceeds what we'd expect by chance, where chance is a random even distribution across the whole brain. So. Um, the convolution with a spherical kernel is really a smoothing kernel, and that gives us an interpretable metric, which is how many contrasts or studies activated in a local region. Uh, we weight by the sample size, the square root of the sample size, um, by whether it's a fixed or random effect study, which influences the quality and statistic values, and other custom quality metrics are possible as well. Uh, we don't like to weight by z-scores because z-scores are high variance and the smaller the study, the more likely it is that you're going to find high z-scores by chance. And so then you're weighting by something that's actually uh, exactly the wrong thing in that case. So it might seem sensible, but that's a choice that, that we've made uh, and you can make your own choices. Um, we do thresholding in this case via blob level permutation. What that means is we take those reconstructed contrast maps and we move the whole blob around. So we're preserving the structure, the, the spatial structure of the activations uh, in order to identify significant regions. And this reduces bias towards small sample studies and towards studies that report more peaks. We can't just, in the worst case, we can't just summarize the number of peaks overall because some studies report many, many peaks, others very few, and sometimes the smallest studies, the worst studies in many ways, report more peaks because they have high variability in their maps. So MKDA is also a gateway to the flexible use of meta-analytic data uh, across many uses. So um, we can do MKDA maps for one condition, like I showed you. We can make difference maps that compare different conditions to one another. We can do chi-squared analyses or logistic regression analyses uh, that, that give us complementary pictures of differences among maps. This really gives us a, a matrix of studies by voxels that we can do lots of things with then. So we can use those to do multidimensional scaling or graph theoretic analyses of the relationships in the meta-analysis. We can use those to uh, visualize regions and cluster them into networks and parcel them into brain regions. We can use them to examine the associations between the incidence of brain activity and the task type for decoding across a wide variety of different, uh, different types of psychological and clinical uh, processes and outcomes. So this is really useful for reverse inference <laughs> in a formal setting. Um, so here's another tool, it's called neurosynth.org, and it's an online tool for meta-analysis that was built by Tal Yarconi a few years ago. Uh, and this contains published activation coordinates from 10,000 neuroimaging studies now or more. Uh, and along with those coordinates, uh, there is saved the text or keywords and topics from each of those studies. So then those studies and coordinates can be mined for relationships. So if you do a term-based search in Neurosynth for something like pain, it knows what the related studies are that talk about pain a lot and the coordinates, and then it will construct an automated meta-analysis of the studies that use uh, pain quite frequently. And this is all done on the web, and there are actually maps now for uh, 10,000 common terms. Um, so here's one for vision, social processing, memory reward, pain, memory retrieval, language, emotion, and, and so on. And this is being actively developed uh, and it can be useful for conducting region of interest analysis or pattern of interest analysis that we're going to talk about later. It's called feature sets in Neurosynth um, for creating co-activation maps, clustering of regions, 
and even uh, recently genetic associations via matching up uh, the Allen Brain Project genetic maps with, um, with meta-analysis maps from Neurosynth. Uh, and so there are lots of things that you can do with it. We won't go over all of them, but, um, but there are many uses. So that's the end of this module on meta-analysis, and thanks for your attention. And that was the first part of the lecture. Now on to the second part of the lecture. Tour, I said 10 minutes! <laughs> <laughs>